Williamsburg, nine square miles, city of 16,000, and the home of the College of William and Mary. For the first time in recent memory, city council elections will take place on November 5th, which is National Election Day. Five candidates will compete for three seats on city council. Residents of Williamsburg can vote for up to three candidates. Today, we sat down with each of the five candidates to discuss their platforms, policies, and thoughts on the present and future of Williamsburg. So, very baseline question, but could you tell me why you are running for city council? Yes. Um, so I am not a politician mm -hmm. by nature. Um, I have not run for political office before, but I became very interested in local politics. Now I've been following local politics for years. So I had attended various meetings and had been really involved with neighborhood groups and downtown neighborhood groups, but I um, had not thought of running myself. But when we started to look at the school feasibility studies and I went to those meetings, I felt like it was time to run and try to bring a new voice to Williamsburg, especially a voice potentially for parents and community members. Um, so could you just tell me a little bit about your connection to Williamsburg and the William and Mary community? I have been teaching at the law school since about three months after we moved here. Um, and then I also teach for the government department. So um, I've taught a number of constitutional law classes as well as my current course, it's called Think Like a Lawyer. <laughs> um, and that is for, it's a senior seminar, so it's for upper level uh, government students. And then I teach legal writing at the law school as well. Yeah, so uh, my career was in the fire service and I came to love this community, um, the people here. In 2019, after 10 years as fire chief, I decided to retire and I was approached by some groups in the community and asked me if I would consider running for city council and I never saw myself as a, as a city council member, but the more I thought about it, um, the more I really felt like um, I had something to give back to the community and plus it was an opportunity to repay the people who entrusted me to be the fire chief for this community and I had a lot of great relationships that I could build on um, and, I, and I just really wanted to offer my leadership experience and my knowledge of local government to help Williamsburg continue to grow. Yeah, so you're, you're deeply rooted in the community and you've been on city council for four years, four years. now. So why are you running for re-election now? Yeah, so, you know, I really think that we, we've accomplished a lot in my first four years. Um, we've had some infrastructure needs. You know, we've made a few steps in affordable housing. We're still one of the most financially stable localities in the Commonwealth. And that's something that we're very proud of and a very low tax rate. So I think there's other things that we want to accomplish. We want to continue um, our infrastructure needs, the affordable housing issue, and how do, you, how do we manage that growth so that we can continue to provide the same level of services. So um, I want to be a part of that as we move forward. And again, because I have local government experience and now four years of city council experience, I think I'm the right person to help lead that effort. Uh, I first got introduced to William & Mary in 1979. I came down here as a uh, cross-country and long-distance recruit. Fun fact, I was class of 84 senior class president. That was the only political office that I have ever run for, except for this one. So that was my first foray into politics, if you will. So I'm running for city council because I kind of believe in good governance, and I think we can do better at the city council level and at the leadership level in terms of better transparency, better governance, better um, voices to be heard, whether they be our student citizens or our in-town citizens, it doesn't really matter. I'm really about trying to bring community voices into the decision-making process you know, at city council. So that, that's the primary driver. Um, so one of the more general questions I have mm -hmm. for people that are running um, are sort of, what do you see the role of city council being within the Williamsburg community? Well, I think it goes back to listening to what citizens want, but also trying to come up with new and imaginative ideas. And I think that takes research. So I think my training as an attorney um, has helped me understand laws and also given me great research skills 
So I, I think it's to bring answers and bring creative solutions. I think that's the, the greatest strength and then research solutions that involve community voices, but also data and some other things that, that maybe the citizens don't have access to. And then to communicate that back and forth so that everybody understands well, why are we making the decision we're making. One of my questions for you, because you're in a unique situation, yes. right, as a student running for city council. Um, you're the only student running for city council right now. So could you tell me a little bit more about what that's like and, and why as a student did you feel compelled to run? You know, I think, you know, as students, we make up over half the city, which when I learned that, I was like, oh my goodness, that's such a large portion. And, you know, you think of a representative democracy, you think of a government that represents the population of which it serves. So over, I'm a big researcher, so doing my research and also just talking with um, friends on campus, also residents in the city, you know, I identified several key issues that Williamsburg um, was dealing with and also things that we can celebrate as well and wanted to put into action um, some of the things that we were talking about. So that's why I'm running and definitely going back to students, so making sure that we have a voice to be heard on issues that matter to us, um, I think is crucial. And I'm curious as well, sort of as a student that's coming into this role, what is your experience with public service? Yep, so from an early age, my parents instilled in me the notion that um, you know, there's no higher honor than serving one's community. I'm um, coming to the college. I was a double major with um, finance and mathematics, so came from a STEM background, but always had that compelling nature to give back. Um, so I'm honored to be in this capacity now, where hopefully I can serve this community. So I feel like uh, the main reason I'm running is because I don't feel that the job is finished. We've accomplished a lot over the past years that I've been on city council, but there's still a lot more to do. I'm very optimistic about Williamsburg, I'm positive about its future, and I want to be a part of moving the city into that future. I also feel compelled because 2026 is right around the corner and there's going to be a lot of attention paid on Williamsburg and I want to help us get those projects across the finish line that will make us better prepared for that celebration. Since you've been on city council for the past eight years and are running for re-election, what sorts of issues or challenges within the community have you seen during those past eight years? Um, and how would you like to address those issues in the future? So I've been thinking about this a lot. And so there's a, a connection, I think, between the past and what's in front of us. So for instance, public safety. We've got a new fire station. We have a police station under construction. Uh, economy, we have, I'm for a very robust economy. We've brought in a lot of new businesses over the past number of years. I've been proud and pleased to be a member of the Economic Development Authority, which helps recruit and retain businesses. If you think about the landscape, of, particularly of downtown Williamsburg, and what it would be like without Starbucks, Illies, Mellow Mushroom, Precarious, Amber Ox, it would be a very different downtown experience. So I'm also for quality of life improvements for the city. I think that a lot of young people now do not judge a, a job solely on, on the paycheck, that they look at overall amenities, what the, the place is to, to live, what are available for social, quality of life, transportation, all of that. It's a very holistic approach now compared to when I was looking for a job. And thinking in that regards, I am for a new library. I am for a live performance venue. I think that we have this breadth and depth of great uh, theater and music and drama and dance, but we don't have, have a home. Could you speak a little bit about what your goals are for developments and affordable housing in the city? So housing is not a new issue and it's a national crisis. Everywhere you go, people have been talking about housing and trying to, to solve the affordability and the availability crunch. And there's no easy answer. I think one thing here in Williamsburg is looking at it as a demand and supply. And we have, particularly right around campus, much more demand than we have supply. 
Again, thinking about what City Council has done and what we have um, as goals for the future is we approved Midtown Row, which brought over 600 beds into inventory, primarily for William and Mary students. We approved the build out of High Street, which has also added a lot more uh, beds and apartments for, for students. And we're looking at the redevelopment of the Blayton Building uh, property into a new building for the residents of the current Blayton Building, but also a mixed use where there would be additional housing, again, probably similar to what you would see with Tribe Square and on that same property. I'm also very supportive of William and Mary's housing and dining plan with uh, the new dormitories coming online and I look forward to not only the first phase being completed but moving into the second phase. Definitely. And what would you say to students that are concerned about maybe the quality of life in the housing that they're currently living in now? Well, it, it depends. Um, I mean, are you talking about on campus or off campus? Primarily off campus. Okay. So, one of the initiatives of the Neighborhood Balance Committee was to create, or is to create, a rent ready program. And this was fashioned after a program that Norfolk has, primarily for sailors who live in Norfolk uh, when they're not out on a ship. And it was developed to provide safe, clean, healthy environments for the residents and the City of Williamsburg has created a draft of this type of program and I think it should go a long way towards making conditions better for students and residents, any residents in an off-campus off environment. I also think that particularly students need to realize that they have rights and not to be afraid to contact the city if their landlord is not meeting their expectations. Um, and the city has information available, the Wayman Mary has information available to make sure that students are, are kept safe. Really, um, one of the pressing issues is housing and affordable housing and also accessible housing. You know, Williamsburg is such a small city um, and there's, you know, an emphasis on protecting our green space, but also an emphasis for growth as well. Um, so making sure that we grow responsibly and also have um, in our minds, how can we attract developers to the city that will benefit the population of which we serve? But what I hear from students is they're concerned about, um, they're concerned about finding housing and they're concerned about uh, what they see as aggressive enforcement techniques with respect to policing. And I've heard their voices at city council meetings as just a member listening to them. Housing is a big one. This is a historically residential um, college and only 50% of our undergraduates get to comfortably sort of experience that. And I think what I would like to do as a, as a leader is work with our state government to try to increase funding. I think President Rowe is doing a great job of bringing our residential facilities and our educational facilities and our arts facilities really up to a great national or international level, but it all takes money and of course it takes time. So no city council member is gonna solve the housing issues in, 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 a, in a year or two, right? But I think that we need to get as creative as we can so that student citizens are having the best experience they can here in town and, and at William and Mary. So that's kind of what I'm hearing from from students. Um, of course, I would look to look, like to look at the data on the enforcement issue to see is this anecdotal, is this a bad weekend, or is this something that really is a trend? And so those, I think, data, the enforcement issue needs to be data driven, and I'd like to look at that so that so that our, our student citizens have a voice with respect to those issues that I'm hearing from them. Um, we know that there's an issue of affordable housing within the community, both for students as well as for families and residents. Um, we understand that the cost of housing is going up, that rents have been going up, and that it can be incredibly hard also to find housing. So I think that's an issue that we really need to look at, not just get data about, but really try to make some inroads and make some changes um, and figure out real solutions to that issue. Also need to think about the use of city land 
it's a finite resource and so we have to think about how we might need that land in the future or how it can best benefit the community as a whole. Um, but that being said, I think that some development may be inevitable um, and may be helpful to alleviate some of the housing issues that we're facing. Um, I do know that there are a number of housing projects that are in process, um, some of which are being built, some of which have not been started yet. And so we will see the impact that those have first before moving into even more development. When it comes to William & Mary housing and the neighborhoods, William & Mary has launched a very exciting and dynamic construction process. And a large goal of that process is to create not necessarily more residential units. We know that we're going to end up with the same number of residential beds that we had before, but they will be new and renovated and nicer for students. And I think that is an asset for the community as a whole. However, in the meantime, we know that we have fewer beds available to students. And so I know that there are friction points when it comes to neighborhoods and I assume it's an issue that students are curious about when it comes to how many people can live in a house and what are those rules. And what I would say is I think that we have to be careful as we grow. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, I, I live in one of the neighborhoods that's adjacent to the college. And so for many years, I've seen our neighborhood grow and change and the students can be a wonderful asset. They can take part in many community activities, but at the same time, I know that there can be friction with neighbors when it comes to how many cars are parked on the street and issues with trash. And mostly I hear about it from the college students in terms of the noise or the noise ordinance. Um, and I think we have to work together. Um, I don't know that the solution for our housing issues really lies in how many people can live in a house. I'm not sure that the housing stock that we currently have really supports more people living in the houses. Now, am I opposed to lifting the three-person rule? I do think the three-person rule plays um, an important part in our community. I think it keeps people safe, honestly. Why? We don't have sidewalks in these neighborhoods. So when we get a lot of cars parked, it can be hard for two cars to go down the street at the same time. That's one issue, but another issue is access of school buses, fire trucks, etc. And as well as the ability to walk down the street to get to class without feeling like you're dodging cars um, that might be coming down the road. Now, a solution to that, yes, there was the four person um, exceptions at one point in time, and, and when it comes to that, there was a lot more oversight. So in terms of having a number of off street parking places or that you have to have appropriate street parking, and, and then there were further regulations as well. So if something was to change, I think it would come with more regulations. Um, but I, I think we have to look broader than this. I don't think that just lifting a three-person rule or a four-person rule really solves our housing issues. I think we need to look at the housing that we have available, and I think we have to see where that is. I think we have to see where students want to live, and I think that we have to do a few other things. We need to see, okay, are there areas that we could develop for more student housing that are not currently developed? Are there ways that we could improve public transportation? Is there something that we could do working with our transit partners in trying to facilitate more public transportation to get people from housing that they like or would like to live in to the downtown area where either their jobs or their colleges. So the second issue I, I wanted to talk a little bit about was um, concerns about pedestrian safety in Williamsburg. It's, it's obviously a concern, uh, a big safety concern, having come from a, a public safety background. Um, so, we, you know, we've added some lighted crosswalks. We just received notification based on some concern that we're going to add another crosswalk further up Richmond Road. Um, there's going to be some new painting to the current crosswalks that's going to, it's a new material that's going to be more reflective. Um, next to the crosswalks, we've eliminated some parking spaces. So it was just to give more visibility to the crosswalks so you can see someone approaching. There, there haven't been many accidents uh, with auto pedestrian or, or bicycles and pedestrians, 
but one is too many. So we want to do everything we can to eliminate those. And it, I mean, it's for the community at large, not, it, you know, enhances student safety. And because we're a tourism town, it, it enhances safety for our tours and our residents. The other issue was pedestrian safety, which is definitely very near to my heart with being a student <laughs> myself. You know, most of us students um, and people of the community as well, we walk throughout the city and um, sometimes we're walking very far and um, at all times of the day, not just during the day, but also at night as well. So I think pedestrian safety, making sure that we have great sidewalks to walk on. A lot of us bike around the city, so making sure that we have um, safe and you know up-to-date biking routes that we can use um, not just for pedestrian safety which is a great concern but also for protecting our environment as well you know and when there's more sidewalks more biking routes that people can use that gets vehicles off the road so we can reduce carbon emissions um, that way as well so definitely important issues <laughs> so I was an RA here and, and, and I actually lived in um, the Bray House before it was moved. And my daughter, when she came here and graduated in 2020, she was also an RA and a head resident. But she actually, um, back in 2019 or 2018, over on the Jamestown Road side of things, over there by the campus center, had one of her students hit by a car. And fortunately, she fell up on top of the car. Um, so I think the lighting and the number of students and the number of traffic that's increased and just the general distractions that students have on campus with phones and things, it, it makes for a very dangerous situation. So I'm for definitely for improving all the crosswalk safety along all of Jamestown and Richmond Road. I'm for providing more of those flashing lights. I think those help a lot, like the one up by the business school. It makes you pay attention. Yeah, I'm concerned about student safety for that, but I'm also concerned about you know anywhere we're anywhere we're seeing crossings, even across the, throughout the city you worry about those things, and so um, I, I'm a big fan of improving our, our, our crosswalk safety. So I think we have to think of the three components here. We've got students, we have residents, and we have lots of visitors. And residents who've been here a while, they understand College Corner. Uh, students quickly learn about College Corner, and but visitors get completely confused i.e. why it was called Confusion Corner for so many years. So it's not just a, a one-person initiative. I think that pedestrian safety is something that the entire City Council has been focused on heavily for, for the past number of months. Some things have already been put into place. For instance, parking spots along Richmond Road were removed to allow for easier visibility of of walkers coming from sorority court. It also provides a much better view shed if someone's coming from Armstead. We plan on repainting all of the crossworks with a thermoplastic paint, which will not only be longer lasting, it'll be brighter and more reflective. We are adding additional crosswalks and active crosswalks where we can. And the crosswalk signs I think are very effective for catching people's attention because you can see them from a distance away. We do have to be careful though of placement of crosswalks because if you have too many not in the right place then people don't pay as actually don't pay as much attention and regardless of how many crosswalks you have people still tend to walk across the street wherever they are. Another thing that we've talked about is putting sensors at the crosswalk so people, when, when they step out, that active crosswalk light will start flashing as opposed to being dependent on someone touching the button. Uh, over the years, we have changed the street light lamps to add more visibility. We, they are now LED as opposed to the gas ones, which used to sort of burn out over time. They would get too hot and cool off. So we're trying to, to make things safer that way. As a biker, I am concerned about protective bike lanes because I think that goes hand in hand with pedestrian safety. And we have a number of proposals in the works for additional bike lanes and also looking at what's the safest type of bike lanes. We'd like overall to help develop a better system of connectivity. 
you know, how the, the pedestrian and bike routes could be joined together and also to help make the public transit system a little bit more robust. We have been working over the past number of years to increase the frequency and the dependability of it. And are there ways that we can work with WADA to, again, think outside the box? You know, ways to have the trolley be on a short loop where it just goes around and through campus. Are there ways to utilize smaller vans for some of the routes as opposed to, you know, full-fledged bus? Is there a way to have shuttles running on certain days? I remember when I, you know, was first here, there would be a shuttle that would take you to the grocery store, you know, and it would sort of run on a constant basis. So those are just a couple things in transportation in general that, um, you know, might want to consider. So we all know there was a bad accident last year um, adjacent to campus involving a student. And honestly, I had class that morning and I had students that came in and were very upset of course, and I myself had been driving down Richmond Road shortly before that accident. And I think it's just very important that we consider pedestrian safety both in the downtown area, but also adjacent to schools. So every morning I see children having to cross busy roads without crosswalks to get to school um, in various areas of the city. And so I think that we need to look at what crosswalks we have, visibility for them, and making sure that our pedestrians are safe and potentially lighting at night as well. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on the WJCC school system split, a l just a little bit more, because I know that that's been of concern to a lot of Williamsburg residents recently. Yep, so probably the most pressing issue right now is with the school system and the community. So right now, James City County and Williamsburg Public Schools are in a joint system, but Williamsburg is exploring the option of splitting from that joint system. So right now as a community, we have the obligation of looking through um, this issue and also looking through what are some of the ramifications of if we stay in the current school system or split. Um, you know, I believe that our responsibility is to our students, teachers, and also their families as well and that us as a community going back to you know there's um, value in diverse perspectives and also listening so listening to students listening to teachers listening to their families and then also um, you know our school board members on what is the best course of action there's a lot of research to be done still as you can probably imagine it's a immense decision and is a, a decision that shouldn't be made lightly as well so what I've been doing I've been um, talking to different school board members. I've been talking with the current city council as well. There's several reports that have come out. So trying to um, familiarize myself as much as I can through research and then through talking through others on what this will look like. Um, as I said earlier, if we stay in the current school system, but split. But a couple different things I've been looking into as well um, with staying in the current school system is how can we expand early childhood programs? Um, you know, I believe that education starts at very, the very young ages, so how can we um, improve our early childhood programs in the city? Also, I've been looking into credentialing programs and expanding that for high school students as well. So I think there's definitely a lot of different avenues we can take, but we need to do more research and knowing the best um, one to um, go forward with. Yeah, on the school system, uh, you know, obviously the city initiated a feasibility study. Um, we're still waiting, you know, still asking some questions of the consultant about some more specifics of the feasibility study. Also continuing to get feedback from the community. Um, but one thing that we announced in the last, I think it was last week or week before, that we're, you know, we're working with, with our partner, James City County, to uh, start looking at a contract that keeps us together in a joint school system. I want the best possible outcome for our students and I say that as a grandparent who has the three children in the WJCC school system. Um, the other concern from a financial aspect is the first year we would be faced with a 2.8 million dollar shortfall but that was just to get to get a similar school system to what we have now. If we implement other programs to address the student outcomes, I'm concerned that that would be much more than 2.8 million dollars. And you know, we 
might bear the burden of a significant tax increase to cover that. Um, so I'm not in favor of that. I'm definitely in favor of, you know, it may, even if we stay in a joint school system, it may cost us more money to address some of the issues. But um, the other thing too, is you have to consider from, uh, at least from middle school and high school level, the social aspect and the athletic aspect. I mean, if we have 350 high school students, we're not, we're not gonna be able to compete in the same athletic divisions as we do, which, which means a lot to students and their families. I think um, based on what I know now, my goal is, is that we can, we can work out an agreement where we can stay together and, and work together to address those student outcomes. Well, I, I think with respect to the school split, what I'm hearing is the same thing. It's a, it's a broken record. Who made the decision to study it in the first place? And so we found out as a result of the feasibility study that cost us about $140,000 as a city that it was going to cost us about $7,000 more per pupil. But before, and in that study, we also found out at least according to what that report said, was that our students are not performing as well as their counterparts in James City County. That should, be, that should have been an issue that was just addressed within the combined system. And it's not a reason for now letting the tail wag the dog and say we should split because we found this. It's just a situation that says we need to get to these kids. We've got 52% financially disadvantaged children in our system. We've got 20% English language learners. We've got 25% special ed kids. And if they are struggling and not doing as well as their peers, in the, if you just segregated them out in terms of James City County, then we need to put resources into, into fixing that problem. And, and having been a high school English teacher, one of the things that I did was developing literacy classes and expanding literacy classes in the ninth grades and 10th, 11th, and 12th grades to catch our children who are at risk of not passing those um, sort of barrier tests that came into being in the early 2000s. And so when the school system really rocks, it says, we've got a problem here with literacy, let's fix it. And, and I, would, that, I think that's what we need to try to do and to keep the school systems combined. If we pull out these kids, I think it's a reverse segregation situation where now these kids in the city of Williamsburg will no longer have access to a larger school to 36 AP classes, to perhaps a football team, because when you have 75 kids in the ninth grade or 80 kids, you can't, you don't have the economies of scale to pull off the things that you want to do to keep, say, athletics, arts, and academics at a very robust level. So I feel that what's going to happen, and, and this is conjecture on my part, right? I don't have any data to back it up. Well, I do actually. But um, if you, now we create this 1,000 person school district, so, the chances of that being successful are very low. And no one has offered up, how is this school system going to be better than what these kids had here? And I'm all for getting these kids up and keeping them in that school system and giving a 52% census population that's financially disadvantaged an opportunity to participate in a more economically affluent school system where their chances of rising above that low income status are much greater. To me, that's what we do as educators. That's the heart of it all. And so creating opportunities should be what educational systems are about. So I don't want to split the school system. I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it'll be good. If you look statistically at the Virginia Department of Education statistics and you, and you just go down and you look at school systems based on size alone, they're not doing very well in general. There's a few outliers. But there's nothing to say that we, we possess the same ability to have an outlier. And the other thing, too, is these kids have been through enough. It's an unstable situation for them. They've been through COVID already. Can we please give them a break? So I think it, it needs to go back and, and sort of understand where we were, what we want to achieve, and possibilities for going forward. And we weren't sure of of some of the achievement scores of our students and possibilities for improvement and so again looking at things outside the box and so we undertook a feasibility study and at this 
point, the contract that was established in 2022 is still in existence with the termination clause that James City County Board of Supervisors took in 23 that has a, uh, a date that it will end. But in my view, it gives us what the information that we have learned from our study, from their study, from listening to residents provides us the opportunity for a joint operating system with fu funding that could be viewed differently than what we have now. I mentioned in the past the example of City of Fairfax and County of Fairfax where the county has 180,000 students, the city has 2,800 students and they have some programs uh, together, their funding is, is dedicated more to each receiving from the municipality. So just one example of how we might, um, again, reimagine a joint operating system here. I, don't, I want people to understand, though, that there is nothing that is going to happen rashly there is no one is going to be left in the lurch there is no intention to do something hastily before everyone is completely prepared yeah and so you've talked about pedestrian safety you've talked about housing the school system as well one of the other issues that i have heard quite a bit from community members and students has been um, regarding transparency between uh, city council residents and students and what that communication looks like. Is that something that's also on your mind as well as you're running? Yes. No, I think the city does try. They have a pretty decent presence on Facebook. Um, I find that's where I can get most of my information about the city. So the city of Williamsburg has a Facebook account, the police has a have a separate one, fire department, um, and kind of down the line. And so there is a good deal of communication, but you have to watch for it. Um, and so I do think telling local residents about what's going on could be very helpful. I think that having some sort of communication system could also be useful, something that you can opt into, such as our, um, you know, where we have the Wave Guardian app on campus, something like that could be useful. Um, I know I felt that way when there were issues within my neighborhood, and I found that I, I didn't know there was a threat. I didn't know that there was a person who police were looking for in the woods right behind my house, and it would have been nice to know that we should make sure our doors are locked or something like that. In addition, you know, that could update us when there's an, a meeting coming up about an issue that might impact our, our neighborhood directly. You know, I, I, obviously, whatever perceptions are, are real to those individuals, so I, I would really like to work on that, but I would like to hear some specific examples of what what people are thinking and could they point to a specific area where we're not being transparent or I'm not being transparent so I could address it um, because that's the last thing I want is a mistrust in our local government. No, I think transparency is key, especially when it comes to decisions that are made um, behind closed doors and also that the information that is presented out um, to the public. Just making sure that everyone's voices are heard is crucial as well, and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table to be heard on issues that matter to them, I think is really where transparency comes in. You know, one of the things that I've been trying to work on as well is inviting people, um, and especially students, to come to the city council meetings, be a more of a active member of the broader community, not just on campus. So I think there's definitely um, room for improvement, but also um, making sure that people are aware of the um, amount of information that is available online or available through talking through our local um, government as well. So I think there are some things that city, the city already does that people may not be aware of that really helps keep individuals, whether it be students or full-time residents informed. One of the things that I do is I sign up for alerts from, from the city, and so that automatically tells me whenever there's a meeting taking place and the agendas are posted on, on, the, on the website there, so people are, are well aware. We really try hard to get the word out. and. Um, we have an excellent public information officer who sends out news releases. We funnel that to the Neighborhood Council of Williamsburg, which again pushes it out. 
One suggestion might be for the student assembly to take the, the news releases that the city uh, um, puts out and put it out to students so that they're more aware not only of the projects that are coming before city council, when the meetings are, and things like that. Uh, in town, what I'm hearing is, is developments are happening to us or things that the decisions that the government is making are just like, where did that come from? And so we had issues with respect to the decision to study splitting the school system, our combined school system, from, um, away from our Williamsburg, James City County school system. And I think that it, th these types of things where all of a sudden development pops up on the radar and people don't know about it, they feel like things are happening to them. And I think good governance demands that people feel involved, that we give them 21st century avenues of communication and transparency into what's going on and a lot of notice so that we don't have those complaints or if we do it's because they weren't paying attention not because we weren't paying attention to getting notice out to them so I'd like to see sort of that that that's what I'm hearing I'd like to see that addressed could you talk a little bit more about your experience with different developments in Williamsburg and and sort of how you would like to see other residents of Williamsburg involved in that decision-making process? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so what we have going on right now is it, look, it appears that Colonial Williamsburg wants to sell the green space that sort of is a collar around, tight in around Colonial Williamsburg. There's a fair amount of green space, probably most of the remaining green space in our city. So they seem interested at least in pursuing development of those properties with what I would call high density properties. I would like to see future development and growth in the city. I'm not an anti-growth person, but I think we start by trying to, f where can we cite these things where the earth is already scraped and how can we preserve the green spaces, the, the precious green spaces and habitat that's remaining for our residents' own physical and mental health. I, to me, that preserve and conserve kind of thing with what little green space left is important for our residents' mental health and, and, and our physical health, but it's also important to preserving Colonial Williamsburg. Because what makes this place an international attraction isn't that we have high density zoning right up to the edge of Colonial Williamsburg. It's that sense that you feel like, ah, oh, I got some space to breathe here. And, and you feel it when you walk down Duke of Gloucester Street at night. There's not that light pollution, there's not that noise pollution, and you get into this peaceful kind of zone. And it's that peaceful tranquility, it's that small town charm that people feel we're losing here. And so when I look at developments, I'm, I'm very much inclined to do what we can to, to, to save green space and to conserve green space and to develop what we can in a, in a responsible way in places that have already been scraped, scraped. And there's plenty of those lots and places. Um, I think the Edge District is a good example of that. Um, some of the places up on Richmond Road and even on Monticello Road and even down 2nd Street, further down even into York County, just right on the line, would be great places uh, to have this sort of, um, what I would call economic redevelopment. And even some of the, um, those apartments that are down on Merrimack Trail aren't really maximized for density, but they could be. And so walkability, rideability, and smart density, I think should rule the day. So it's about planning and it's about letting our citizens be involved in the planning and our leaders meeting with citizens to say what, what is really responsible and, and how, do we, how do we plan a 21st century Williamsburg so that we don't lose what's precious about it. Because once you develop the golf courses, once you develop the green course, and once you take away these precious green spaces, they're gone forever, you don't get them back. And so I think, I don't wanna see Colonial Williamsburg hurt itself, you know, sort of what I call death by a thousand cuts. So those things are important to me, and I hope to be able to open a dialogue up with our partners, because our, our major partners are Colonial Williamsburg, obviously, and the College of William and Mary, and, and our tourists. And so I, I'd like to see an open dialogue about that, not one that's aggressive or anything like that, but just one that says, let's really think about this. This was one of the first planned towns in, in North America ever. So let's keep up with that concept of being great at town planning. So when it comes to development and growth, clearly it's important to maybe 
explore redevelopment versus new development. Last year, for instance, there was a proposed development um, that was potentially going to take down some of our natural resources. And, um, and there was a big movement to, to stop that, um, both because of traffic flow and other reasons. But one thing I think that we do need to be careful of is, yes, preserving our natural resources. So the woods that surround the college, the various waterways that we have, um, and making sure that we are pay, paying attention to that environmental impact. Yeah, I, I do think because um, I mentioned our infrastructure needs, so we ended up with a police station, fire station, and a library that all three facilities were built around the same time, so they reached the end of their useful lifespan at the same time. So they're, you know, very expensive projects. And so I think there's a lot in the community that's worried about uh, our fin financial stability for the city and what are we going to see increased tax rate um, so that, I, that's a big concern I'm hearing from the community. Um, also, the other thing I, I think you're going to continue to see is developments wanting to come to Williamsburg. Um, again, everybody wants to come to Williamsburg because of the, the small town uh, uniqueness, the unique character, the charm of Williamsburg. Um, so developers want to come here and, and, you know, we had eight housing projects um, that could have potentially added 1,200 units of housing, um, but they were not all the right fit for Williamsburg. So I think we're going to continue to see those developers uh, come forward. And, and I, I like to ask as well, since I'm sort of done all of my official questions, uh -huh. if there are any other comments or things you would like to say uh, to anybody that might be watching this or anything about you? Um, anything additional? Anything additional. So um, I was recruited here to be a distance runner. So you have to be a little bit crazy to be a distance runner, and you have to be a little bit crazy to want to get dip your feet into into politics. Um, but I'm but I'm doing this as a community service. I, I'm not doing it to become a city council member or, or anything like that. I'm doing this because as I feel like I owe something back that I took when I was here at Winnie I took a lot of things for granted that were here, and I want to be able to to have a legacy that says, at least at the end of the day, he tried to make this place better than the way he found it. And, and I think, if anything, that's the reason that I'm running for city council. I would say, similar to what we've already said, that I feel that I am the for candidate. I believe that it's important to, to look to the future, as they often say, that's the reason your windshield is far bigger than your rear, rear view mirror, is to, to look forward. And so my, my platform is on how do we make things better? How do we make things better for the residents, for the city overall, and help achieve the goals that we already are working towards? I'm optimistic about Williamsburg, and I have found being on city council the most rewarding job I've had, because I do take it seriously as a job. And so I want to continue doing that job finish an egg and or at least finish the next phase of it and uh, and continue being on city council. I relocated to Williamsburg 10 years ago so I have been here for a number of years and I came here because we wanted a family-friendly community to raise our children where neighbors knew one another and work together um, and that's exactly what we found. We found that we were welcomed by our neighborhood, that we found resources here for children, that we found a lot of activities. We enjoy daily dog walks in Colonial Williamsburg and walking around campus. We've enjoyed getting to know students, so many students over the last 10 years, and seeing what they graduate and go on to do, um, and just enjoying Williamsburg. And the truth is that I really like Williamsburg and I think that a lot of people do. So I'm not looking to change our core values. If anything, what I'm looking to do is as we grow, the growth is sort of inevitable here. So as we grow and as we change and develop, I want to be a voice for the community to ensure that we keep that sense of neighborhood, that sense of working together and all coming together um, because I think we make this city richer um, if we work together. So, um, 
the three things I like to tell people if they if they remember nothing else about me is to remember my um, commitment to the community not only through my fire service career um, but as a member of city council and I'll also say this to everyone is when I retired there was there was a after three months I felt a gap in my life because truly I'm a public servant at heart and that's why I, I decided to run for city council as well and the other thing I like people I'm, I bring experience leadership I, I led you know a fire department and made decisions about um, not only emergency needs but a budget and personnel and those types of issues so I bring leadership experience and then trustworthy I mean I, I'm not in this for me um, I could have I had a great career and I could have walked away from that and been extremely happy with what I attained in my career um, but I'm doing this for the community and, and I feel like um, those are three things that make me a person that is, is can lead the community um, if I'm reelected. Mm -hmm. You know, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, Williamsburg is a community, and you know, I hope to strive to just foster and celebrate the wonderful community that we have here. So, like we talked earlier, whether that's investing in our public schools or increasing in pedestrian safety, um, making affordable housing more um, accessible for students, young families, and also service workers of our community as well. I think that um, definitely celebrating the work that's been done but also looking forward not just right now but also down the road is crucial so it was great speaking with you here today yeah you as well <laughs> so after all those serious city council questions we've also been asking a few <laughs> just fun overarching questions oh, as great. well um so one question that i had for you is yeah. if you have a favorite small business or restaurant in Williamsburg? Oh, that's a really great question. So when people ask me this, I always say the candy shop. So let's candy shop. Growing up, I, um, for as little as I can remember, I just remember walking in and immediately smelling just the delightful smell of chocolate and looking at all the truffles and just with amazement. <laughs> so I always love going back there and Kilwins is also a great one that I probably don't go enough, honestly. <laughs> um, but they're two of my favorite businesses here in Williamsburg. <laughs> That's great. I also have not been enough, I don't think. <laughs> my favorite restaurant in town is the Fat Canary. And the chef and the people there, they're just the coolest people ever. So I, I, I just love the Fat Canary. And of course, it's part of the cheese shop, right? So the whole thing goes together. So you can get your sandwich or you can get your, you know, great meal when, when you know your special occasion great meal over there and so it's just it's awesome and you're right there on, on dock street so I, I, I that's my favorite restaurant here in town yeah. i've never been to the fat canary yet. you haven't I, oh, I need to go. You, yeah. should, you gotta go you gotta get someone to take you yeah exactly <laughs> yeah maybe maybe with my family isn't yeah, absolutely <laughs> just make that reservation yes, yes. <laughs> based on my pocketbook i would say that the clothing stores in merchant square get my most attention and as far as restaurants, I like to, to try them all. I want to be sure that what I'm experiencing is good so that when visitors come to town, whether it be on Richmond Road, further in, or in Merchant Square, that they have a good experience. My favorite, can I say both? You can say both. <laughs> my favorite small business is Window Fashion Design because that's my son and daughter-in-law's business. Um, they do custom window treatments. Um, they're a small business. They're not in the city, but they're they're in James City County. They're a small business. They work really hard, so they're they're obviously my favorite small business, um, just because it's it's family. Um, my favorite restaurant, Sal's. Over by Food Lion, that one. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the classic. Yes. <laughs> I'm there way I'm there way too much. Yes. <laughs> It's funny, I actually have a list of restaurants that I give to my 1Ls because I teach legal writing, which is for uh, new law students. And so I like to welcome them to Williamsburg and tell them about the various coffee shops and different restaurants that are walking distance or driving distance from law school. Um, it's hard to pick just one. I, I really go to a lot of the different coffee shops because it depends what I'm in the mood for. So it's probably going to end up being a coffee shop. Oh, but we can't forget about ice cream. So my daughter and I go to <laughs> ice cream shops kind of constantly. And in terms, we like to walk to Merchant Square 
and it depends. Sometimes Killwinds, and sometimes it's Baskin Robbins. It all depends what we're in the mood for. Mm -hmm. Where is your favorite place to walk your dog in Williamsburg? Okay, well, the place that I walk my dog most frequently is campus. <laughs> so we walk through campus all the time, and Olive is our golden retriever. Um, some of you may have met her. Some of the people watching may have met her too. Um, and she loves the students and she loves to walk around and find her rolling around a lot on the grass. Um, and so I really do actually enjoy walking through campus. It's really pretty. And one of my favorite spots, honestly, is Lake Matoka. So I love to walk down to Lake Matoka and sit on the dock there um, and then hold on so she doesn't actually jump in. <laughs> but. Um, but that's one of my favorite spots. I find it to be really peaceful, and I would encourage any student to go down there and, and just study by the lake or take a walk and enjoy sitting by the lake. What is a song that's on repeat for you right now, or a favorite song? A favorite song? Mm -hmm. I listen to country music, and mm -hmm. uh, not a lot, but when I'm in the vehicle, that's what I listen to. Mm -hmm. But the country channel's on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all I listen to is country music and, uh, you know, occasionally, uh, what, NPR or some other news station. Mm -hmm. But if I'm listening to music, it's, it's definitely country music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect in and of itself. So what is the most recent book that you have read? West with the Giraffes. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it started out as a, a beach book this summer, and a friend of mine had read it in a book club, and so then I picked it up. And it's the story of two giraffes that came from Africa, and they sort of shipwrecked in New York during a hurricane, and then a gentleman was sent from San Diego to New York to pick up the giraffes and transport them to the San Diego Zoo, which was just starting at that time. It was in 1947. And he hired a young boy to, to help drive or to drive across the country. And it was their trials and tribulations, perseverance, resourcefulness, camaraderie, contesting each other a little bit, but it was one of those feel good human stories. Very cute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing, you know, high up there, yeah. but, uh, but something, just a, a good book. Yeah, definitely. What is your favorite movie or the one that you've watched the most recently that you've enjoyed? I think my, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Sting with Robert Redford and Paul Newman. So um, I recently watched that with my adult children. And uh, I love, it's just, it's kind of, it's, it's funny and it's serious all at the same time. And it's, you know, obviously about two con men trying to con the con men, basically. So uh, I, I enjoyed that. Perfect. I need to watch this movie too. I have yeah. to add things to my list, <laughs> clearly. So another one that we have been asking as well has been if you have a sort of, um, do you have a song of the summer? Oh. Yes. Mm. That's actually a really great <laughs> question as well. You know, I'm a big country music fan actually, so Zach Bryan's new album was definitely on repeat out this past summer. But I also like EDM, so I think Clarity by Zed definitely was probably my song for the summer. <laughs> You've got a broad spectrum. Yes. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and then my last question for you, just as a student, yes. is do you have a favorite William & Mary tradition? Ooh. You know, I always love convocation at the beginning of the semester. I think it's such a great experience. You know, you think of community again. I think it's such a community building experience. Seeing all of the new members of, you know, Willie to Mary, all the new students come in and just really just celebrating their great work and um, joining our community, I think is crucial. But also, it's just such a fun time. And, you know, um, once everyone comes to the Ren building, um, just afterwards being able to talk with everyone and just kind of celebrate and dance as well, um, I think it's very special. So that's probably my favorite one every year. <laughs> Love convocation. Yes. yes, the energy is always so good. <laughs> Now that we've heard from each of our candidates, let's hear a little bit more about voter registration in Williamsburg from Pirouette, one of our Flat Hat News editors. Hey, 
Any U.S. citizen who is a resident of Williamsburg, including students, is eligible to vote in the upcoming election. You can register to vote online or update your voter registration to Williamsburg at elections.virginia.gov. The deadline to register to vote without having to use a provisional ballot has already passed, but you can still register up to and including election day on November 5th using a provisional ballot. A provisional ballot simply means that it's not going to be counted on election day, but it's subjected to approval by the local electoral board at a later date. Booths will open at your nearest election venue at 6 a.m. and close at 7 p.m. on November 5th. Five candidates will battle for three seats. Which ones will be chosen to lead Williamsburg into the future? Only time will tell, but for now, I'm Emma Henry, Flat Hat Online.